It allows us to focus uh, rather than a kind of a scattershot approach. There's now a very focused approach. It's changed the atmosphere in the workplace. There's no one standing around the water cooler. As much as the work factor has gone up, the satisfaction level has gone up also now. This is the way to do police work. There's nothing new here. It's just that we had gotten away from it for uh, a very long time. We're back into it now big time. We're not going to solve any crimes from this building. The people that are actually doing a job are the, the men and women of the department that are in the field. So this is just a process that we want pushed all the way down to that roll call and into those training sessions. The officers must know why they're going out there. It's about sharing the information, solving crimes, locking them up, identifying patterns quicker, sooner, getting that information out, and seeing that every piece of this department, whether it's a staff support piece or an operational piece, is doing everything they can in furthering the mission of reducing crime. The, the fundamental element of the Comstat process is bringing a borough in with the borough commander, the precinct commanders, the narcotics commanders, uh, robbery squad commanders, auto crime, where they have to stand together and demonstrate the plans they came up with to address the problems that they face. Some people consider it uh, the best thing that's ever happened to the police department. Some people consider Comstat to be their greatest nightmare come to life. If you're running your place right, your people should not have to get ready for three hours before a Comstat. It's a day-to-day -day process that goes on 365 days a year and actually working on your precinct's problems. Comptat is a very effective management tool. It makes us very aware of what's going on around us. We have to be on our sharpest at all times. We've got to be on our game 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because you never know when that phone is going to ring and it'll be a deputy commissioner, it'll be the chief of department, it'll be the chief patrol, and they've got a question for you about an incident that may have happened that day or the day before. It makes us very aware. We have to be aware. And the city uh, is a better city because of it. We're a better run police department because of it. <laughs> My staff is prepared, I'm prepared, you know, it's, it's an everyday process with us, so uh, it's just sort of uh, the biggest thing is just getting here at 7 o'clock in the morning. Other than that, it's a it's, uh, normal course of business. Ida John, is that the area that borders the 104? Okay. So on the screen, what we're looking for now is the 838-104 uh, uh, border. And we'd like to see the burglaries up there for both precincts. And we've got transit on standby to discuss the uh, crossover robbery uh, patterns, right, between the two precincts? Yeah, if, uh, if you look at the crime of robbery in 83rd, uh, we're down. We're down uh, the last few years in a row, very significantly down. If you look at the hom uh, homicides and shootings, we're down uh, significantly, 100%. We have not had a, a homicide uh, this year. Uh, shooting victims and incidents, we're down 64%, 57% respectively. And I'm wondering, uh, if we're getting print response, and are we finding prints of value? Have we been utilizing the Warren squad to go out and hunt these individuals down? Well, we're not, not going to operate on that assumption, right? <laughs> we got you there. Come on. <laughs> but I think we've uh, we've covered just about all the important areas that we had mapped out for this point. Why don't Why don't we take a five minute break now? Thanks. Mm -hmm. It, uh, we expect the unexpected, and uh, we weren't disappointed. The changes that have been made so far, um, hopefully, are not permanent, because it's an ongoing process. The process is what we want to become permanent. It definitely starts with the, the leadership and the will of the people in charge. Uh, it, it's a total change from how we were doing business for X amount of years. We have a lot less burglaries, a lot less robberies, because we know where to go, where it's happening, because Comstat uh, gives us all of that information. Just holding the line isn't good enough anymore. They have to, they have to get out there and show some results. 
Now when the community gives us information, there's a good chance that within a week or so, they're seeing results of the information they're giving. So now we're getting more information from the community. Stuff that they thought, well, if I don't tell, you know, what am I, am I going to tell the police? We're not going to, nothing's going to happen here. Now they tell us, I think they can see we're taking this information and we're actually processing and we're doing things about it. And arrests being made. Uh, buildings are being closed. Stores are being shut down that were maybe operated for a couple of years illegally and now they're being closed. If not closed by us, they just closed down because they can't operate anymore. And we have the crooks on the run and the crooks know it and we know it. Well, what we're doing here is we have decentralized accountability, responsibility and authority. We have not decentralized ultimate control. We still maintain control at the headquarters level. We maintain supervision, monitoring, if you will. But we have decentralized, but at the same time, we have had a process we call inclusion. Giving it down to the precinct commander, but including in the decision-making process that he or she has to make, everybody who has an ability to influence the decisions and the strategies they're working on. Detective squad commanders, RIP commanders, narcotic squad commanders, district attorney's office, everybody is now included. And what CompStat is, or exemplifies, is that inclusion. That everybody in the same room, when they go back to their precinct, they might not have everybody in the same room, but everybody is interacting in anticipation of coming to CompStat. That it's not just show and tell one day a month, 29 other days, you've got to be prepared to get in for show and tell. So if you're not including everybody in the game, you're going to come in very deficient. And nobody wants to be blindsided. So it's a marvelous management technique. There's also been a lot of concerns raised about the atmosphere in CompStat. Were Chief Maple and Chief Anamone too tough? You know, was it intimidating? Was it putting seasoned commanders on the spot in front of their peers and subordinates? It was all of those things and was consciously intended to be all of those things. If you can't stand the heat when you're surrounded by all your buddies, what's it going to be like when you're surrounded by all those people acting up? CompStack can be done anyway. You don't need the, the level of sophistication we've developed in our process with these 20-foot uh, screens. It can be done in a computer terminal. It can be done in a small department with pin maps, like I used to do in Boston 20 years ago. My office as a lieutenant in Boston was just wall-to-wall -wall maps with push pins so that we have technology available to us here. But all CompStat is, is, is information that's shared for the purpose of achieving established results. And the results you want to reduce crime. And that's what it does. Take a look, see if you want to become part of it. We thought it would be a great time to look back on the department's incredible history. No other agency has had a bigger impact on law enforcement than this one. There are so many firsts pioneered by the NYPD, the first police department to have regular firearms training, the first bicycle squad and bomb squad, the first to widely adopt the 911 call system for emergencies, and so much more. So there's plenty of history to choose from. But the topic of tonight's discussion is the perfect way to get this conversation started. Because when you talk about innovations of policing that shaped our profession, there's everything else. And then there's CompStat, the platform that's been copied worldwide for the past 30 years and revolutionized how police departments talk about crime. Of course, by 1994, Data tracking wasn't exactly a brand new idea. Just a few months after becoming president of the NYPD Police Commission in 1895, Theodore Roosevelt used month over month and year over year crime numbers to discredit a New York Times story that said he was about to get fired. The reporter had written that the city was out of control and the NYPD wasn't doing anything about it. So Roosevelt called the reporter and other members into his press office, grabbed a ledger off his desk, and showed them that actually arrests were up and crime was down. His cops were doing their jobs, and he had the mayor's full support. 
That story sounds eerily familiar to today. <laughs> so Teddy Roosevelt became one of the first in a long line of NYPD executives to use crime stats to make that point. And anyone who has ever been to a podium at a ComStat meeting knows the numbers don't lie. What made ComStat such a game changer wasn't the data, it was the people who designed, developed, and directed it. We have two of those architects here with us tonight who understood that it wasn't enough to have accurate, timely intelligence. You needed accountability because cops are just like everyone else. They learn faster when they know the material is going to be on the test. <laughs> and as a former precinct commander, I know exactly what those tests are like. <laughs> Imagine getting ordered in real time in front of a live studio audience, and you better have all your receipts. I wouldn't describe it as a fun experience, but it was definitely effective. And three decades ago, it changed policing in a department and around the world forever. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for the members of this incredible panel for sharing your stories with us. And we hope to see you back again at our next event in the series. Have a great night. And I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate Bill and Ricky on 25 years of wedding bliss. Congratulations. God bless. And I wish you so much more. Thank you, Commissioner Command. At this time, I'm gonna ask everyone to draw your attentions to the video monitors on both sides of the stage for a ComStat video presentation. The fundamental element of the Comstat process is bringing a borough in where they have to stand together and demonstrate the plans they came up with to address the problems that they face. This is the way to do police work. There's nothing new here. It's just that we had gotten away from it for a very long time. We're back into it now big time. If you're running your place right, your people should not have to get ready for three hours before a Comstat. It's a day-to-day -day process that goes on 365 days a year. All Comstat is, is is information that's shared for the purpose of achieving established results. And the results you want to reduce crime. And that's what it does. Crime was down in five of the seven major crime categories. The mayor and the police department attributing it to precision policing. We know who's pulling the trigger in New York City. We will do everything within the law to shut you down. Caught red-handed, fair beaters abusing the subway system. This is what the community wants, this is what they're asking for, this is what they expect of us, we work for the community. The NYPD seized 6,429 guns off the streets of New York City. 
And we have the crooks on the run, and the crooks know it, and we know it. Thank you. And now to conduct a ComStat interview, it's my pleasure to introduce ABC Eyewitness News anchor, Bill Ritter, and the 38th and 42nd Police Commissioner of the City of New York, the Honorable William J. Bratton. If I break this for myself, my wife will be very angry. <laughs> Only Bill Bratton would come here to celebrate this 30-year uh, anniversary on the anniversary date of, with his wife, right? Who else would do that? No, they would say, yeah, you know, let's make it another night or something. But congratulations. Mazel tov, as we would say. Most of my police career would not have happened without uh, Ricky O'Kaying it. So there you go. There you tonight's go. no exception. So before we get into the weeds on all this, um, what do you feel when you see a, a, a video like that, after, after that? Where you started that and where we've come? Looking at that video, I'm sure for many of the people in this room, brought back many great memories because I work with many great people. And the strength of the NYPD is just that, it's people. Great concepts, CompStat, precision policing, extraordinary techniques, but it's the people. And CompStat was created not by one or two individuals, but a consortium, many of who are in the room today, that kind of the unsung heroes. Now it's just a, for me, a walk down memory lane, a wonderful walk down memory lane. There was a mention in there, I forget who said it, uh, but he said, well, this is not really anything new, we're just getting back on track again. But I bet you think it was down new right then. It was very new, because up until the 1990s, uh, police were responding to crime because it was believed that cops couldn't do anything about crime. C crime was caused by poverty, racism, uh, the economy, the weather. Uh, crime is caused by criminals. And the one thing we weren't focused on was the criminal. And what CompStat brought was a new mindset that the idea of basically gathering information, that, that the old mantra, timely accurate intelligence, rapid response to that intelligence, effective tactics, and relentless follow-up. But over it all was the concept of collaboration. All of us talking to everybody, from a detective on up to the super chief and commissioner. Overall, it was transparency. The idea of in a profession that celebrates exclusion and secrets, it was about inclusion, sharing the secrets, what's working, what's not working. And as the commissioner alluded to, and many of the people in this room can allude to, it was tough. It was intended to be tough, and the reason the department does such a damn good job, it basically had a lot of tough people that knew what the hell they were doing. Was there any feeling towards you that, hey, what are you doing? We don't need this, we can do this ourselves. <laughs> we got a lot of that. That uh, John Miller, what was the expression when I introduced you and Jack Maple to the, uh, uh, the command staff for the first time? What was, what was Jack, uh, Jack Maple's comment? Wait till they get a load of us. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till they get a load of us. <laughs> he had the top investigative reporter in the city, this kind of chubby uh, transit police lieutenant that were now basically with me, the kid from Boston running the greatest police department in the world. Uh, it was quite a change. Let's, uh, let's go into how it's changed since then. I know that you changed because your hair was all dark, just like mine was back then. <laughs> there was um, a lot more of it. And it's different now. Oh, that's great. Hold on. Uh, John Miller, nice to see you. A former colleague of mine at ABC News, and uh, now uh, not a colleague, but uh, doing a great job at CNN, and really great, a really great job. You're giving them Comstat in your way of doing it, I think, by giving the viewers real information about what crime is all about and how do you fight it and what happens behind the scenes. Um, but let's, let's talk about how it's changed, because I think that how it's, how it's proposed now and how, what functions it does right now is different, number one. Number two, I got the sense that, from what you've said in the past about this, 
it, it, and you said it tonight too, you opened it up so everyone has the information. You know, we get this, we get this document every week from the NYPD and we see where, where crime is up and where it's down and it's down a lot and it did. We had to look at this and say this is where it is and yes, all the things that are happening, you might get the feeling watching the news for instance, that is not safe out there but the numbers, so you know, liars figure but figures don't lie and that's what this is all about. What Commissioner Caban uh, indicated in his comments were the idea of the accuracy, that the figures are real, that uh, as we indicated that we were not going to uh, um, stand for any sharp pencils. We wanted accurate information. It was important to know where it was happening, when it was happening, and who was creating the problem. So the transparency was critically important to it. And uh, the substance of a success was that transparency, not just within the police department, initially within the police department, but now the public. The public can go online and see in their neighborhood that their street address what is happening, and almost in real time, what is happening. We never had that before. That, uh, if anything, we used to hide the numbers under the bug. I used to joke when I was in Boston, uh, when I became commissioner in Boston, that my predecessor, the reason he was bald, when I stepped into the commissioner's office, I found all the secrets hidden under the rug. So his head was rubbing against, against the ceiling because of all those secrets they were hiding. But, you know, the truth is what you're seeking here, and that is, whether it's all numbers or whatever it is. It's the same thing happened, a lot of people felt, when, you, when, the, when the police department started with body cams. You know, oh, 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 you know, you know, look at how, how great it has been. It's gone the other way completely, right? There are some people in this room that were against it, I think, mm -hmm. at the beginning, and look what's happened. You know, it's not different that much in this way than we reporters, right? We, we report the truth and the facts, no matter where they fall, and that's what this is doing. Here are the numbers. Let's go figure it out. Use those numbers to go forward. And the beauty of it is that it's always a learning experience because you're always sharing information, what works, what doesn't work. Um, medical profession, police profession are very similar. The uh, medical uh, uh, foundation is uh, to do no harm. Basically, the police foundation is to, although we have the power to use even deadly force, to use minimum force. And one of the ways that we can do that, minimum intrusion into the lives of people, is increasingly with what CompStat started, that has moved to preventive policing, now precision policing, that we are able to pinpoint, particularly with technology today, with much more accuracy, who are the criminals in the city. So we can reduce racial tension, by, for example, by not stopping every black kid wearing a white t-shirt in the middle of summer. We know who we're looking for because one, we have the information, we share it, and most importantly, we share it with the public also. And the openness of the department is, uh, began with CompStat. CompStat opened the department up to itself, but then opened it up to the larger community. How long did it take for CompStat information to make its way to the public once it was started? In the old days, basically, uh, what Maple, Lou Anamone insisted upon was each day, each precinct, and the uh, commissioner and others in the room, remember this, would have to fax their crime stats up to headquarters every day, where headquarters would start entering them. You'll see at the back of the room, Bill, you didn't get a chance to see it, is the original CompStat computer back there. I see that. It's an old-fashioned yeah, computer. And it, I think it says Pebble Flintstone. It's Pebble <laughs> Flintstone on it, right? It was bought with police foundation money. So they would enter that information and basically gathered up. So we began gathering information, and CompStat was held twice a week. We'd go over that, what was back in that day, very timely information. Because most of the time, the crime stats were gathered for one purpose, to report it to the FBI. And the FBI always reported next year the figures for last year. Where CompStat is right now, Commissioner sitting there right now, I, I can guarantee he can pull up on his phone and give you exactly how much crime has occurred in this city up to the last hour. It's where the technology has become so beneficial. But back in the day when Lou and Jack were running CompStat, Joe Dunn <coughs> is in the room and others who were on the receiving end and then eventually got to the end of the table where they could ask the questions. It was all about having the answers but everybody had the answers. It was an idea of coaching it out of them, sometimes beating it out of them, to get the answers to why crime up, why is crime down. 
And it was just a, a phenomenal uh, initiative. And thank God that uh, we had it because it literally saved New York City. It saved New York City and it saved hundreds of thousands of lives. So when you look back, Bill, when you look back at all that, how much has it really changed? When you're looking at that computer out there, and that's, that's a long time ago, there's no question. Things change yeah. faster than anything. How, how much has it changed now, from then to now? And what are the, 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 primary, the primary drivers to that? I mean, I assume technology is part of it. What's changed since 1994 and 2024 is how the information is gathered and how it's used. In 1994, we had to get $10,000 from the police foundation to buy the plastic sheeting to go over the wall maps that were in every precinct. And then the precinct had put up little stick'em dots that would show the different crimes, red for murder, blue for robbery, yellow for this or that. And what started emerging? Hotspots. That's where you wanted to put your cops. Now, with these phones, it can be done instantly. Back in 1994, back to my transfer days, 1990, that we used to do VCR videotapes to send out to every precinct where I'd send out messages to the troops. The commissioner now sitting there right now can get on this phone and reach all 35,000 of his cops right now because every one of them is carrying a phone that they can all connect with each other. What has changed is the connectivity, the ability to communicate with each other. And what has also changed is the overall theme of CompStat was urgency. There were people out there being raped, murdered, robbed. We can change that. How are we going to change it? We're going to find out where it's happening so we can prevent it from happening. And that's what changed. We went from response focus, where we were measuring our success on the number of arrests, response time to 911, to where we're now measuring our success on the number of lives we were changing. And that's how it's changed, that the urgency of crime, that that's why we want it up to the minute, so we can save lives. You, uh, w when we first talked a couple of weeks ago about this and, and me coming up here and talking to you, you, you mentioned several things about, about Comstat that has changed over the years. Productive policing, uh, the body camera footage also goes on there, and that's, that's interesting. Um, I want to know what you think is going to happen in the next go round. When we sit here, 30 years from now, together, and have what's <laughs> happened since the 60 years since Comstat we'll, we'll started. See, we'll see about that. <laughs> oh, it's gonna happen. I just know it's gonna happen. You just have your 25th wedding anniversary. It's a long way to go. Um, what, what do you think is gonna happen next? What's the next big thing that's gonna turn this program around? No, it's interesting. I remember seeing the uh, Tom Cruise movie, Minority Report. Some of you might remember that. And the idea of be able to predict the future and how far-fetched that scene while he was moving all these things around on those screens. Think how recent that was, and it's here, it's happening now. And with AI, AI is going to literally change everything. The ability of AI to effectively um, speed up the process, to speed up the urgency. Um, I'd love to be here for 30 years from now to actually see what would happen. I'm, I just thank God I've been around the last 30 years to one, work with some great people, many of whom in this room, to create CompStat, and with CompStat, create the greatest crime fighting tool that the world has ever seen to date. CompStat will still be around 30 years from now, but it just have a lot more bells and whistles. What do you think? Can you just look in the future? Just pretend you're not going to be here. Let's say you're going to the last 25 of those years. Just what is, what, what is it going to do, do you think, to blow people's minds? Just like the people who 30 years ago sat down with you would say, my gosh, look at this. The commissioner can talk to every one of his members, 37,000, like that, or can pull up any kind of data, and any of the people who work there can do that. So what's the, the big picture going forward? The big picture is, uh, the beauty of it is, nobody can actually paint it right now, because as fast as you're painting, it's changing. And that's the rapidity of what is going on in the world, whether it's AI or the other technologies. And that's the exciting aspect of it. But behind it all is still always going to be people. And behind it all in the police world are going to be cops and the civilians that work with them. And you keep hearing me express the term as if I was still in the business, we. Uh, once a cop, always a cop. That uh, I can tell you there's not one of these retired guys in this room, men and women, 
who don't wish that they could get back in the game again, who don't envy Caban and envy the rest of them that they're, they're still in the game despite all the, the headaches that... Uh, a couple, of, a couple here that might not want to be back in the game, but I think most of us would love to have another, another go around again. Well, if age is the question, I think it's out of the question because it doesn't matter. Age shouldn't matter. We're going to be around for 30 more years, and we're going to be doing this interview 30 years from now, so they can go back to the police force. It, the force, though, has tremendously changed. The faces of the force have changed. The commissioners have changed, all for the better, I believe. And it reflects this great city and how it mirrors the people who we are police, you are policing, right? When I uh, came on the job 1970, October 7th, after my, one day after my 23rd birthday, my first badge, uh, Boston Police Patrolman, badge 1190, red patrolman. Why? There were no women in the Boston Police Department. First one didn't come along until seven or eight years later. And um, similarly, in this department, the NYPD, took a while for the numbers to change, but NYPD is now a reflector of the great city it polices, a minority majority department. When you look at the leadership of the department, that reflects the change here. Uh, you had uh, three Irish commissioners in a row here. Actually, there were four. <laughs> Kelly, myself, uh, O'Neill, and uh, Jeremy Shea. Uh, and now the transition that uh, basically reflective of the, the change in the city. And as you say, all for the good. And Dermot is here, by the way. Dermot, good to see you, Mr. Commissioner. You know, you look at that, and you look at the faces throughout it, and, and I know we've had to deal with it as journalists, um, and a lot of people in the city, uh, you know, saw what was happening in the, mid, in the Middle East, and I got more proud of New York because I look at this great diversity that's in this, in this city, and... The, the, you take a vow when you move here or are born here, I think, a kind of vow that we are all here to help each other. And if we don't take that kind of attitude, well, then what's New York about? New York is about doing this. One information, here it's information. The other day, someone sent us a thing, and I think your department put it in a, in a nice, colorful form. 15,000 X hundred guns saved, confiscated, where is it? Okay, confiscated. In, in two, the two years and four months of the Adams administration. That's a lot of guns to, with, to get all out of. And you get that from the numbers. You get that, and you find out where the guns are from Comstat. Am I correct? That's correct. That Comstat basically is able to give you good numbers and bad numbers. When crime's going up, bad numbers. When crime's going down, good numbers. I wouldn't say the, uh, I shouldn't say once, frequently, after I left the police commissioner's office and went into civilian life and give speeches all around the country, teach, that crime would never go up in New York City again. And I believed it strongly. Uh, what I did not take into account was politicians and the political leadership uh, of some in the city and some in the state that basically have undone over the last couple of years so much of the great work that was done. But the beauty of CompStat is it is able even in the face of that adversity, to keep pushing out the numbers, showing that when crime is going up, we know why it's going up. Laws that don't work, powers that have been taken away, lack of trust in the police. So out of that change, it basically motivates the department, its leadership, its men and women, to work even harder to prove that the department can be trusted and to prove that give them the right tools, give them the political support, and they will get the job done. Um, back then, you were considered something of, uh, do I say rebel, you know, but progressive. You were progressive. And I remember the last time I... I don't use that term anymore. Well, <laughs> but there's a reason for that. Uh, and let me give you an example. Last time I talked to you, when you were on our air, in fact, for our Sunday morning uh, series called Up Close, every Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, politics, um, I said, you know, I, I look at, at, at social media, and you're getting devoured, you know? By, by your, why, you're not a right winger. And you said, no, no, I get blasted as one, but I think I'm still the same. I'm, I'm progressive like I was before. But the term has changed. And you've changed. You didn't change. They changed. So the, the chewing up is not what it used to be. I'd like to think, and I describe myself, and I describe police as centrists, that we're in the middle. The old Teddy Roosevelt, the man in the arena, bloodied but not bowed. 
the idea that police have to be in the middle, that whether it's in the midst of what's going on right now in our universities around the country, uh, or during the elections, the right and the left, uh, we are the we are literally the glue that holds the, our democracy together. The men and women and uh, the few. If, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Commissioner Caban and his people are dealing with is a lot fewer cops than I had to work with as recently as 2016. A hell of a lot less than we had to work with back in the 1990s. Howard Safer for a while had 41,000 cops. Wouldn't you like 8,000 more? <laughs> what you could do with those 8,000 cops right now. And uh, no, it's, uh, you support them, give them the resources, they'll continue to get the job done and get it done in better ways. But you were considered, uh, this was a radical thinking to do this with, this, with Comstep. It was considered that, right? You were a rabble rouser. What was radical about it was that for 30 years, when I came into the business 1970 up to the 1990s, police were really excused from doing anything about crime because Society, politicians felt was crime was caused by things that police could not control or influence. But fortunately, with people like Jack Maple, Lou Anamone, others that went into a leadership position with us, John Chimney Miller have been reporting on the crime issue, that we believe that cops could do something about crime because who did we deal with? We dealt with the criminals, and that was the cause of crime. The challenge, however, was to deal with them constitutionally, not to break the law to enforce it, compassionately, you're dealing with human beings, and consistently, that in a city that has so many poor, distressed neighborhoods, not to police those neighborhoods differently than the more affluent neighborhoods. And by that, I don't mean, in a sense, the quality, but the quantity necessary to make those neighborhoods safe. And uh, we did it, and that continued to do it with even fewer resources than we had. Just think of the challenges that uh, Commissioner Caban and his people face in the rest of law enforcement. Back in the 90s, the good old days, Louis, we dealt with crime and disorder. The secret was to focus on disorder for the first time because it was felt that, you know, focus on the serious crime. And we got it done because when we married the two. Now, after 9-11, terrorism came back in. Now, in 2024, your question about what does the future hold, the technologies that the department has to be uh, efficient in dealing with. As recently as a uh, time working with John Miller, John remembers this, in 2016, the city council would not approve the department basically even testing drones because they didn't trust the department to use those drones efficiently. Remember the fiasco with the electric dog? <laughs> they didn't want you to use the electric dog, that uh, this futuristic device that everybody is eventually going to have in their departments. No, it's uh, the idea of the constant issue for the department and its leadership is to win that trust. Going back to your point about, I describe myself and policing now as centrist, because progressive has in fact taken on a negative connotation. But I've often talked about in my speeches that there's no entity in America that was more progressive and willing to change than American policing. Uh, when I look back at what it was in 1970, when I came into the business, the corruption, the brutality, the racism, the incompetence, the idea of crime, nobody paid attention to crime back in those days, versus now the prioritization of all those things, of human rights, of crime, of dealing with disorder. What a change. And you know, you talk about the new wave of, of cops, um, but there's also an old wave, and we saw it, Commissioner, uh, this last week, last week, when all of a sudden there was a, a great ceremony men and women whose parents had been cops and had died in the line of duty, some of them, um, all of a sudden their, their kids are getting promoted. And that was so moving and so powerful. And I thought at a time when the police department has changed so much, that stuff stays. That stuff lingers for the better, I think. We talk about police, the police family, and it, it really is that it's uh, brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, and we make a commitment of cops when they come on the job that if something unfortunate were to happen to them, we would never forget. <clears throat> so what you talk about this ceremony last week among one of the officers being on it was uh, um, now Captain McDonald, son of Stephen McDonald, who was shot in Central Park back in the 1980s and stayed on the job in his wheelchair and respirator 
and basically worked up until the day he died. 2017. 2017. 2016, um, Stephen came up to Boston when my father passed away, along with about 300 members of the department, to attend that funeral service. Steve came up all that way in the condition that he had to deal with. And that was just reflective of the family, the brotherhood, the sisterhood of policing, and why I and the people in this room love the profession so much. As we have a motto, the motto we've been using is cops count, police matter. Because every day the individual action of a cop, every day the collective action of the NYPD makes a difference in people's lives. And what CompStat did, it effectively harnessed the energy, the creativity, the strength, the force multiplication of the department to focus it laser-like on what was creating fear in this city. And it focused it, and like a doctor now using lasers with pinpoint accuracy, they've been able to effectively deal with crime. Can you imagine what crime would be like in this city without that system? No, and, and you also give the, the, the population of New York a chance to see what the facts are so that they can make their own decisions, and I think that, that helps a tremendous the idea of winning trust. I'd like to make a, a, a shout out here that uh, uh, you might have noticed that the commissioner was very resplendent up here tonight with a bow tie. Uh, I think the only person in the room with a bow tie, and uh, I, I salute him for that tie because one of the things we're here to celebrate tonight are several of the people that were involved in the creation of Constat, Louis Anamone, certainly, some of the team over here that were involved in basically creating the term Comstat. And that, uh, but uh, the late, great Jack Maple, who was always resplendent. Jack's son, Brendan, is here in the audience with us. And I was Sorry, actually uh, probably well, hiding at the back. Unlike, there, unlike his dad, he's the, he's, the, Brendan. He's, he's the shyest person in the room. Stand up, Brendan. <laughs> you got to come up. No, there you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and Brendan, like his dad, wanted to become a cop and, uh, and uh, most cops that uh, sons and daughters of bosses get a chance to pick their first precinct, and a lot of them will pick uh, some of the tonier precincts to start off. Uh, Brendan uh, wanted to work where his dad began in Brooklyn and some of the toughest precincts. Uh, just reflective of that, but uh, Ed, thank you for wearing that bow tie tonight. It's a, a very fitting uh, memorial of uh, Jack. And, uh, and also, if I could sh do a shout out about uh, Louis Anamone also, that a lot of attention is focused on Jack, the back of the room, the, the memorial. Uh, Jack could not have been as successful driving the concept of CompStep without somebody who basically was in the department, who understood the department, and was as brilliant as Jack in getting it done. And that's Louis Anamone, who's here tonight with us. So, Louis, thank you. <laughs> I didn't have to ask him to stand, which that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Um, you know, I, I wrote a note about you and, and saying, you're perhaps the most respected and certainly best known police commissioner slash chief of police in the country. I think that's not hyperbole. I think that's absolutely true. It shows and, up in a mountain a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that. And, and so you, you look back at your career, you look back at 30 years, you look forward because I know you're still involved in all this and you got a lot of opinions about stuff. I know that because I ask you on the air about that. Um, how do you view your, your looking back, your old, yourself, and, and what role you played in all this? Well, as I look at myself, that uh, I'm, I stay in the game, that uh, I've consciously opted uh, not to step away from policing. I'm still in the private sector, advising private sector clients, but stay involved in as many ways as possible. Police Executive Research Forum, proud to have been one of the original members of that. Chuck Wexler, the chair, executive chair, is here tonight. And I still, with John Miller, every year go up to Boston to teach 300 to 400 young captains and inspectors coming up on communication and leadership. So I try to stay involved at, uh, because back in the 70s when I first came into the business, uh, I decided then that uh, Shimon Perez, I once was privileged to attend a speech he gave in Chicago, and he was asked about his legendary career in Israel, military leader, prime minister of Israel, and about decisions he made early in his life. And he said, I made a decision early in my life which book I wanted to have my name in. 
And the person that was asking the question said, what do you mean, which book? He said, did I want it in the guest book or did I want it in the history book? And early in my life, I decided I wanted to have my name in the history books. I wanted to have a legacy. And thank God I've met the Louis Anamones, the Jack Maples, the John Millers, the Joe Dunns, and many of the others in the new generation, Eddie Caban and his people, who basically ensured that legacy, that legacy of the profession of policing, the nobleness of it, and the cap capability and capacity of it. So I'm glad I stuck around as long as I did because I think I've got a legacy that's secured through the hard work and creativity of so many others who I had the privilege of at some point, time, at point in time selecting, leading. Uh, I often say I've been privileged to have more Super Bowl teams than just about any NFL uh, manager or coach because I've had the NYPD twice, the transit police, had the LAPD, had Boston. So uh, had a good run. Man, four, four, I'm no not question. running anymore, I'm still walking. You've had a good run, you've been lucky. We've been more lucky, we've been more fortunate. And uh, right, we, the people who know you know that you're, they're better when they know you. And to have you do what you did and still be here and be active. Does he call you, do you call him, talk to him? All right, that's good. It's, he appreciated his guidance is what the current commission says. Bill, a little memento of being here this evening. It's on display at the back. Uh, the CompStat, the articulation of the four principles, were actually written by Jack Maple on a napkin up at Elaine's. And when we opened the new CompStat room, we uh, police foundation commissioned the napkins that, uh, from Elaine's with the four steps. So just a little keepsake of your being here tonight for the 30th oh, anniversary. Oh, well, thank you. Usually I would get this from John Miller because I think he was like the best customer <laughs> you, when he was a young reporter, right, at Elaine's, John. And usually there'd be a drink on it. Oh, well, thank you very much. John. This, thank you very much. That's how we kept losing the notes. <laughs> I, yeah, we, we wrote them on the, news, on the uh, napkin here. I don't know where it is. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for everything you've done. Thank you to everything they've done. Yeah. Yeah. discussion so I'd like to introduce our moderators tonight our first moderator is the director of policing and public safety at the Manhattan Institute Miss Hannah Myers and our second moderator the director of John Jay College's NYPD executive master's leadership program professor Peter Moscos Welcome, everybody. It's great to see all of you. Some of you I know, some former students, uh, some former colleagues, and uh, people who I've spoken to at length, and, and thank you all for coming here. Yes, this is truly an honor, and we're going we're gonna to introduce our panelists, invite them up, ask a few questions to each, and then with the time remaining, which is, is going to be fairly short, we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, the man that really does need no introduction, uh, who was just up here, but Commissioner Bratton. Uh, please join us here, 46 year career in law enforcement, um, twice NYPD commissioner, chief of Los Angeles to P Police Department, Boston, transit police. Um, if you don't mind me cutting your interview short, I'm gonna leave it at that, but I do wanna mention that everywhere you went, crime went down, um, and for those who don't want to give you credit for that, you must be the luckiest man in the world that I want to go to Vegas with you. Um, I'm lucky many times over. I have Ricky, and I've got the opportunity to work with most of the people in this room. Uh, John Mueller, who's chief of police, of, uh, the police at MTA, started as a police officer at NYPD in 1992, joined Yonkers PD in 1994, and rose there to police commissioner in 2019, he is a graduate of John Jay College of Criminal Justice and has 28 years in law enforcement before joining MTA. Chief Lewis Anamone, born and raised in Brooklyn, retired in 1999, 35 years serving NYPD in the city of New York, uh, started as a civilian member of the Police Trainee Corps in 1964. Um, Commissioner Bill Bratton promoted him to Chief of Patrol in 1994 and then to Chief of Department. 
Um, Chief Anamone earned a BA from the University of the State of New York and a master's from California State University. Since retirement, he has provided training and consulting services to numerous cities, and most important to me, um, as an adjunct professor, he taught the first five cohorts of John Jay College's Executive Master's Leadership Program. Michael LaPetri is the NYPD's Chief of Crime Control Strategies. He joined the department in 1994 and began his career on patrol in the 73rd Precinct. He also served in the 79th and 83rd Precincts in the Gang Division, Patrol Borough Brooklyn North, Narcotics Borough Brooklyn South, Narcotics Borough Brooklyn North, and Narcotics Borough Manhattan North. He previously served as the Commanding Officer of Transit District 32 and of the 101st, 79th, and 75th Precincts. Prior to his command, uh, promotion to Bureau Chief in 2019, Chief LePetri served as Commanding Officer of the Office of the Chief of Department, where he led the department's ceasefire and crew stat efforts and played a central role in the ComStat process. Now as Chief of Crime Control Strategies, Chief LePetri co-chairs ComStat meetings with the Chief of Department. He also oversees the analysis and monitoring of trends across the city, Department of Strategies uh, to reduce, uh, Development of Strategies to Reduce Crime, and he ensures that these strategies are applied, applied across all NYPD units. Chief LePetri earned a Master's of Arts in Criminal Justice from John Jay College, a Bachelor of Science in Sociology from Excelsior College, as well as being a 2013 graduate of the Police Management Institute at Columbia University, well, when that was still a functioning place. Uh, <laughs> I didn't write this by the way. I didn't write this by Stab uh, And he's also a 2004 graduate of the FBI National Academy of Quantico. He has completed the International Collaboration of Policing Masterclass with the Police Scotland International Academy. Uh, and finally, last but not least, we are joined by Greg Roberts. Greg is the, Mr. Roberts is the executive director of the New York City Police Depart uh, Foundation, excuse me. He has over 40 years with the foundation. He has worked with NYPD on many of its most innovative programs, including the op Options Program, Crime Stoppers, Operation Gun Stop, and the Real-Time Crime Center. Thank you for being with us. Um, Chief Anamone, I'd, I'd like to start off, though anyone is welcome to, to uh, add something to this, but um, Joe Esposito, who sadly passed away a decade after, served nearly a decade and a half as chief of department, and he passed away in January, um, he led more ComStats than any other person, I believe. That is absolutely. Hmm? That's absolutely. That's <laughs> correct. Get you right. Uh, could you yes. tell us about... Um... So, uh, I met Joe in 1991. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. In August of 1991, during the uh, Crown Heights riots. So, on day four, when I first showed up, Joe had been there three days. He was uh, serving with a broken hand. His hand was in a cast. He wouldn't leave his people. Talk about leadership. So I had my eye on him, and then Commissioner Bratton also noted Joe, along with Joe Dunn during our ComStat meetings. Terrific leader, terrific police officer, somebody you'd want to be in the foxhole with. And a leader of men and women in this department, he held and conducted more ComStat meetings than anyone else in history, in this city and in this country and in the world. He's a, he's a big loss. Thank you, thank you. Let me follow up with you, Chief Hanamone. Um, when you started, when you took over as Chief of Department 30 years ago, um, Commissioner Bratton was saying how, you see, almost implied that police departments embrace change, which is not uh, my experience with, with, with policing so much. How did, how, how did you overcome the inertia of such a large organization um, and let me also just follow up. Uh, did you think at the time that we'd be having a 30th anniversary or anything like it? Yeah, I really didn't think too much about the future. Uh, back then, it was day by day. It was ComStat meeting by ComStat meeting. It was looking at the uh, status of the uh, neighborhoods and the communities in the city. So I, I wasn't really focused down the road. But what I will say and I don't know that it's been mentioned 
ever before, or uh, certainly not in depth, that there's a different level of ComStat. So certainly back then in 94, we were looking to create a sense of urgency because there hadn't been one. I was born and bred in the NYPD. I love that agency, but we weren't always, you know, playing our A game. ComStat kind of changed all that. We started focusing, and everyone got in the game. Uh, but there was pushback. Not everyone was happy about it, but we did it. We got it done. We had people like Jack Maple, the visionary, thinking of it, thinking of this whole system. People like, uh, and they're here today, Gene White, Bill Gorder, uh, people who aren't here tonight, Helena Malisi, John Yo, at the very beginning, behind the scenes, making this happen. So that level that we're trying to talk about is that organizational change that Commissioner Bratton knew about and he used this system, this CompStat system, to change a bureaucracy of 35 and later 40,000 people so that it's been institutionalized. We're seeing the benefits every year since that 1994 year. This department has changed and it's changed for the better and it's, it's with us. And who, who, who would have thunk it back in the day, right Joe? Who would have thunk it? If I could just mention, I'm glad the computer there is under glass because Billy Gorta was going to go home with it. He took, he said, that's my computer. And he was going to offer it to John Yo as a, as a present. Uh, Chief LaPetri, if I could ask you, Comstat can play a large role in an officer's career. I think many fear to the negative. Maybe could you talk about how you felt it impacted your career, how you see it impacts others, and maybe misconceptions about that relationship? Sure, I, w I would not be sitting here today without Comstat. And I, and I tell young, young commanders this all the time. Uh, you want to be up at that podium, you know? And, and if you, you, you take care of your cops, you take care of the community, you take care of the crime in that order, you will be a very effective commander. And every day is, is the process that you use for the Thursday of ComStat. If you're running your precinct, you're running your transit district, you're running your PSA for ComStat, it's gonna show up at that podium. You gotta live it every day. You got to show you cops. You live it every day, and it all just comes together. You want to absolutely be a, 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 up at that podium. Very, very quick story. I was a uh, narcotics commander for three years in Brooklyn North. I had a very, very busy module at the 7981 module, and I was up at the podium almost every single week. Being, uh, you know, Espo really uh, talking to me a lot, and uh, I get picked for. I transit District 32 commander. I had a lot of experience. My first time going to transit, Chief Hall brings me up to his office. He goes, you know why you're here, kid? I said, no. And he takes out a piece of paper, and he had dates of ComStats, and he was saying certain things about me being up at that podium. He goes, that's why you're here, and this, that's why you're a transit district 32 commander. Do, so, you think, do you think most officers see that potential, or it takes a while to recognize that? Look, it's not easy. We don't make it easy, you know, and, and, and it shouldn't be. You know, it's, it's a very, very... Uh, it's a, first of all, it's an honor to, to be a commander, whatever commander you are, you know, a narcotics commander, any commander. It's, it's an honor, and you're leading. It's a very, huge responsibility leading, leading young men and women every single day to do the right thing, to keep them safe. And I think it's the most rewarding uh, part of this job, and ComStat kind of just puts it all together. Um, Chief Muller, if, if I could ask you, you developed a whole iteration of ComStat for MTA police. Can you talk about how you thought that through, how it developed, has it changed, and, and how does it differ from NYPD CompStat? So the one thing we realized about CompStat, and I, I was a believer from day one, and I got to watch this, um, not with a front row seat, but you know, on the outskirts, just as a Yonkers police officer, and uh, you know, one of the commanding officers told me, you know, crime ebbs and flows with the tides. Can you imagine telling Chief Adam on that at CompStat? <laughs> I, I don't know if it go over well, but. What I love about CompStat is you can move it along as time goes and how community perceptions change and, and the things that you need. Not every agency has to deal with, you know, 50 robberies in one command in a month. But CompStat, you know, the foundational principles of CompStat are very, very agile and you can move them around. So, for example, in the MTA, we don't have a lot of major crime, but it's the biggest transit authority in North America. We move millions of people every day. So you have to go where the issues are. So what we figured out was, 
we take these customer surveys, very high level customer surveys done extremely well, and we pull out all of that information and we're able to grade every single station in the MTA system. Uh, and you either get an A or you get a B or a C or a D for each station. And it gives perspective and it provides an illustration for commanding officers to say, you know, you tell me you have 40 stations in your command and I get that and I know it's hundreds of miles, but most of them are green. 80% of them are, are, are green. What about the reds and the yellows? Focus on those. And when you give that kind of context and that kind of perspective, it just makes everything all, all easier. If I could circle back, Chief LaPetri, how does that differ from the way that you and Crime Control Strategies collect data outside of CompStat and apply it? Well, I'll say this, you know, in 30 years, the, the principles of CompStat really haven't changed, right? What has changed is the analytical tools that my office uses and also the technology. If I can tell you, the, first of all, I have computer programmers, I have data scientists, I have analysts, I have uh, experts in research methods that work that work in my office, you know, using Domino, Python, R, you know, uh, geospatial analysis to pinpoint exactly where the cops need to be. I'm going to give you a little data that is going to kind of like blow your mind. We've identified 3% of the area of New York City, 3% of the area of New York City that's responsible for 35% of the shootings. Where do you think the thousand cops are going to be going this summer? in those 3% of the area. But we drill down even further. What's the times? 5.30 to 2. On the weekends, what does that go to? 4 o'clock. So then they stay at a 17.30 by 04, you know, 04 o'clock. And we, we layer it, and we layer it, and we layer it. And really, that is, that's done on a daily basis. I can tell you right now which block in New York City has the most confirmed shots fired, the most shootings in the past 365 days. When you look at gun arrests, and we talk about 4,000 gun arrests with, like Commissioner Bratton said, 5,000 less cops, 4,000 gun arrests, and we're on par to do the same thing this year. We know 25% of under the age of 18 arrestees with a gun will be involved in a shooting in two years. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, what it means is that's where we put the cops, in the crew areas, the younger crew areas, where we see an increase in violence. And they're making those gun arrests, and it's affecting the crime. I mean, look, two years, we're down over 700 shootings from two years. Last week's CompStat book, we were only up 12% from the lowest year of shootings that we've ever had. We're, yeah, I know a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people don't, because, you know, we're, we're dealing with that perception. And we know, the commissioner says it all the time, perception is important. It is important. But the reality, the perception is, is talked about every day by the executive staff, the police commissioner, and really, you know, getting dropped down to, to the men and women that are doing a tough job out there. If I, uh, Commissioner Braden, this the idea of perception and reality, you were very good at um, controlling the narrative and dealing with media. Um, I'd like you to talk about that a bit, but specifically, Chief LaPetri talks about gun violence, which has incredible racial disparities. Therefore, policing is going to have similar racial disparities if it's, in, if it's as much as it's uh, focused on gun violence. How do you how do you present that to the public? Because that creates a lot of um, opposition. You deal with that by presenting it to the public, the idea of giving them the facts, the figures, and getting out in front of those facts and figures. The, some of the undeniable facts in this city, unfortunately, is the sheer amount of crime that occurs in the poor, largely minority neighborhoods of the city. And the uncomfortable fact, who's committing that crime and who are the victims. It's a story that needs to be told so you can put it into context. One of the things that drives me personally crazy and drove the late George Kelly uh, uh, very crazy was the concept of trying to link broken windows policing, quality of life policing, uh, that somehow or another that enforcement of minor crime uh, because of the in this city, the racial disparities in terms of who's committing the crime, who's being uh, summoned or arrested for the crime, that those numbers basically are used as a bludgeon against the police, when in fact, careful analysis indicates exactly what the chief is talking about. You put your cops where the problems are, and whether it's a black neighborhood or white neighborhood, you put the cops there. The challenge is when they're there, 
is to have them perform lawfully, constitutionally, compassionately, dealing with people as people, and consistently that people in those poor neighborhoods don't feel that they're being treated differently than people on the Upper East Side are being treated by the police. Difficult challenge, because as any cop in this room will tell you, the realities of the streets in the poor neighborhoods are very different oftentimes than the reality of the streets in the richer neighborhoods. So that's that thin line that they're constantly walking that they don't fall off and fall off and get into, into trouble. At being a cop today is difficult, extraordinarily difficult, but this is where the numbers help and this is where the transparency helps. The ability of the commissioner, the first deputy commissioner, the ability of the chiefs to get out there and be there with facts and figures that are basically irrefutable. Mr. Roberts, you, you have a unique, a unique vantage to, to everyone else here on this panel. <laughs> what, what is your perspective having, how, can you talk about how the foundation has worked with the development of Comstat over the years, how, how you discuss it internally and uh, how you've seen it grow and change? Well, first, it's an honor just to be here with this group of people. And at the foundation, we're privileged to work and support the NYPD, which is truly an honor as well. So when Commissioner Bratton mentioned before, he called the foundation to get that um, equipment for Comstat, I got the call. And to make a long story short, I ended up going shopping with Jack Mabel. J&R Music, J&R Music on Chamber Street. Now, those who know Jack, Jack would enter this room or j and it's like the D train entering the room, right? And it's just like, right? right? So, shopping with Jack. You did a lot with Jack, and we spent a lot of time in the lanes, John. I don't know how often you went shopping with him, but I will always remember that, and that's where that computer came from. So, on that computer, one last story on a Jack Maple napkin. What does ComStat stand for? It's not computer statistics. Comparison. Comparison statistics. And that's what it is. Comparing day to day, comparing all these numbers, that's where it came from. But really, I tell that story because there was an energy to Jack, not only bigger than life, bigger than the D train, but it was all, I mean, Louie was uncontainable, but everybody around there then. And what Comstat did, it unleashed this human side too. It put your cops to work. And I'm very happy your team still has that energy. It's still out there. It's in. It's in the NYPD and the men and women. And again, it's a pleasure to be part of that. I could expand on that story in terms of Comstat. Gene White tells the wonderful story of the night of the snowstorm when he and the rest of the team were locked in their little room trying to computerize uh, with that wonderful machine back there. Basically, all those stats that would be coming in from the precincts faxed in every day. And they're all rushing to get out of there because the storm is basically going to make their drive home a, a very risky and daring one. But the last challenge was to, what do we name this system that we have just now created? And I write about it in my most recent book, and, and Gene, to listen to Gene over a couple of years tell the story of it, it's hilarious, that uh, finally, what was it, Gene, that somebody just said, well, we have eight, eight letters that we have to make the name, and that's where comparative statistics comp stat. That's where the, the origin of it. It was that, that fast. Get the hell out of there and get on the road to beat the snowstorm. It, it had to be eight letters because it was a computer file. It was an executable computer file in the old DAWs format. So it was comstat.exe. That's right. Yeah. Um, Chief Animal, when you led Comstat, I don't know if the people in this room know that, but you had a certain, um, what's the word we're not supposed to use, aggressive reputation. Uh, could you... Well, by the way. Um, well, uh, how, how, how do you defend what you did, sir? Good, sir. I was told, uh, I was told that the uh, mission of the NYPD was to prevent crime, improve the quality of life in the neighborhoods, and uh, I think that was it. Prevent and improve. What, what was your three-pronged test for any? The tactics that we were going to use were going to be legal, moral and effective. And we drilled down on that at every meeting. Listen, we created a sense of urgency in 1994 that didn't exist. And we talked a little bit about that sense of urgency continuing. But 
to the organization back then, and I said this at the JFK school, it was like a shot of adrenaline to the heart of the NYPD, Comstat, just woke everybody up. And then you unleashed through the commissioner, he wanted to see people try things. There was no uh, issue with trying and failing. He wanted to see ideas, he wanted to see people, and he gave them that authority. And we tried to encourage them at those meetings. It wasn't always nasty, but we had people pushing back. You were asked this question earlier. You don't change an organization of 35, 40,000 people overnight. It took a while, it took a lot of work, a lot of hard work, and a lot of leadership up and down that line. And uh, I miss Jack, you know, I, I miss Jack terribly. He was the guy, thank you. Has, has the transition at MTA been similar? You know, it, it hasn't. I, I got to watch uh, Ed Hartnett, who was a chief of the NYPD, and he became uh, a Yonkers police commissioner, and I learned a ton from him. Uh, and I watched the pushback, and it's much what, um, you know, those that came before us talk about, about this resistance to it. That it's just a different way of doing things, and, and people didn't want to buy into it. Um, Sometimes it's, it's just they're, they're too far along in their career to want to buy into something new, which is why it's so important to capture younger commanding officers that really want to try something different. I think it's, you know, it's true that when you go through something like this, um, after a while you're kind of out of ideas if you, you're there long enough. So getting younger people involved. Uh, for us, what I found was interesting in, in the MTA, as opposed to Yarkers, was so much of it had to do with public speaking. They knew about their commands, they knew about their districts, they knew about their crime problems. They're just very uncomfortable getting up and speaking in front of people. So we went a little bit slower, and we started just saying, tell me about your districts. The first month, they had to do a presentation on their districts. The second month, tell me about your crime. Third month, tell me about your top offenders. And we went from there. And you can almost see the change. And, and you know, when Chief Adamone says, you know, change the culture of the NYPD, this, these guys changed the culture of our entire profession, not just in the United States, but in the entire world, where up to the point when I was a young cop and I started in 92, I mean, we were kind of told, like, yeah, you know, you can't do anything about it. And then a bunch of, I wouldn't say progressives or anything else, I'd say believers, believers came along and said, you're damn right, you can do something about it. And we did do something about it. So going a little bit slower with the MTA PD, for what I found, worked a little better. And I'm a people watcher, so I do notice that as time goes by, in the, in the first couple of meetings, they ran out of the room as fast as they could. And now I watch them, they stick around, they talk to each other, they trade notes, because really what you're trying to do is bring the very best out of everybody. This is a group think exercise every single month. What's the best way to do something? If, if someone, if she has found a better way to do it, let's capitalize on that, let's share that with everybody else. So um, it's going well, and, and, and we're having a lot of fun with it. It might be worth mentioning, um, I mean, I've interviewed uh, three of the people up here and another half dozen. I just briefly have to plug my book that's coming out later this year, Back from the Brink, about the crime drop and Comstat. But one of the things that constantly um, came up in these interviews I did was, and it's hard to imagine, and I say this now as, as part of the older generation, um, but the impact on crime. Jack Maple... Um, whose tapes I had access to, and, and Mike Daly wrote about it in his wonderful book, um, came to the NYPD uh, and started poking chiefs and saying, how many people were shot last year? And nobody knew. Nobody knew how many people were shot in New York City in, in 1992. And if you, even, if you see now, uh, you know, the, the shooting data goes back, then you, you collected it for the previous year, so we have 1993, but that's the only time we started getting that data. Um, that shift to a department focused on crime is hard to imagine the, pre, the, the preceding years on that. Um, and that cultural change, I'm wondering, Commissioner Bratton, if you could talk about how, I mean, you, you worked for Yonkers and, and, and MTA. Is it fundamentally the same that you can apply to different departments? When you went to LA, was there, did you discover a different culture or could you use the same techniques? Every city, every agency has got its own culture. Boston, LA, uh, 
the transit departments have headed up, the hundred some odd departments have consulted with. Uh, they're all different, but what is not different is the profession, the idea of what we exist to do. But it's a matter of trying to inspire those different organizations to arrive at a system that will work in their city. It's like a doctor with every patient coming in to see him, six foot tall, five foot tall. The success of that doctor is how much medicine do you give that six footer versus the five footer? The idea of the diagnosis, and then what is the level of treatment that that patient will bear? So Los Angeles is a totally different city and a totally different police department and culture than the NYPD, and much, much different, the two of them, than the Boston Police Department. So what CompStat was able to bring, much the same as in the medical profession, was a way of diagnosing your patients and then effectively applying the right amount of medicine to your particular patient. In Los Angeles, the gang problems in Los Angeles were much more severe because of the size of them, the organizational size, than in the city of New York, which had a huge number of gangs, but they were the corner gang, they were the neighborhood gang. In LA, the Blood, the Crips, the MS-13, thousands of members in one gang. So the scale of what the LAPD was dealing with was very different than what the NYPD was dealing with. And the NYPD had a lot more medicine, a lot more cops than the LAPD. But what CompStat was able to do was effectively, it was a phenomenal diagnosis tool for any department, whether it's dealing in a transit police agency or dealing with an urban mega agency like LA or New York. Well, Peter, I think we shall get in trouble if we don't turn it over for the last little bit to q and Is that, am I right, or do we have time for? Yes, Jim, Jim Quinn. No, wait a second. We're going to hand you the mic. Yeah, we have the mic. Testing? Yep. Uh, first, congratulations on CompStat. I mean, it, it is phenomenal. The, the question that I have is that crime has gone down in New York City between 1993 and 2019 by 80-85% overall. And yet, the laws that were passed in 2019 that took effect in 2020, bail reform and all those other things, were the result of a, a kind of antipathy to New York City Police Department practices. Why do you think that we've lost the PR battle or the PR war in the fight against crime? Why do you think that the legislators in New York State changed the laws to such a degree after so much success over 27 years? Let me speak to that. One is going back to the point that we've talked about repeatedly, trust. So many of the legislators in Albany now in the city are from a different generation that, uh, uh, you know, the 30s and 40s, a lot of them, very few people there, 40s, 50s, and 60 year old. So. Uh, their experiences are different in some respects that they're the beneficiaries of a much safer city. And the irony of it is they don't understand how it got to be a safer city. Because from their perspective, oftentimes, they feel it was the idea of the department not treating their constituents with compassion, with morality. And that's where the challenge was, is, and will remain the same for whether it was myself, German, now the Commissioner Caban, to ensure that the men and women of the department are effectively complete, uh, performing in that professional manner. And the irony of it, what you talked about, the change in the law, the defund the police movement, they wanted to take money out of the NYPD and what would be cut? Training. If we all understand what is essential is better training, more training, constant training. And to cut back money for the department, where's it going to come out of? Training. Because they don't want to see a reduction in the number of cops in the street. 
So this is the great dilemma in the sense of convincing this new generation of politicians that there is a new generation police department. Uh, Louis will tell you, Joe Dunn, the difference between departments I came into in the 1970s, they came into the 1980s, with Commissioner Caban and some of his people came into in the 1990s, night and day. We're constantly evolving and constantly evolving in a good direction. Unfortunately, so much of our political leadership doesn't recognize it. Do you, do you feel like they have a sense of what happens in CompStat? Do they come see? Do they have a sense to try to ground them more in the realities uh, of the types of data that are discussed and, and, and how precision policing works? One of the things that I think would be beneficial is if more of them would, in fact, come to CompStat meetings and just see firsthand the, what the chief here is able to do with technology and what the focus is. And one of the great frustrations is why are there so many cops in the minority neighborhoods? Because that's where the need is. That's where the calls are coming from. And that's if they could see that firsthand, but unfortunately most of them never been to a CompStat meeting. They don't, they don't get it. And so that's the idea of the inclusion we're talking about, not just to look at it on the, uh, the, the web, web page, but to actually come in and see firsthand, or do ride-alongs from time to time. And uh, it's where that transparency is so critical. If I could just add to that, so uh, a few months ago, maybe about six months ago, something like that, uh, the NYPD started a community comp stat. And it's myself and Chief Madry up in the dais, and the commanders are, are there, and I'm asking them questions just like a regular comp stat. You know, it's not as in-depth, but then the community is asking us questions, is asking the commander questions, and they're getting to see the, the way ComStat, you know, is, and it, it's, it's a really, it was a great idea, um, and, and Commissioner Caban fully supports it, and it, it really is opening up eyes. The other thing that, that we've done, and this is now for police agencies, um, I get a lot of requests to come at a prep, and that was never, that was really something that was never done. So on a Wednesday, a lot of agencies also, you know, not, I just had the Dominican Republic in, and they actually sit and watch us prep and, and how I prep with my team about Thursday's CompStat. And we think it's just something that really has expanded the idea of CompStat. My, oh, can I follow up on that? A lot of people think of CompStat just as the interrogation part. Um, but I, maybe, Chief LePetria, Chief Animon, if you could talk about um, the collaboration process. Because one of the things that Jack Maple said when, I, when you ask someone and they say, oh, we're collaborating on that, Chief, he said, that's the biggest lie in the world. There's no collaboration going on here. Could you talk about the role of ComStat, um, sort of, in a way, the behind the scenes, but it's not behind the scenes, but how, how it gets different groups working together? Well, I mean, Com ComStat's a communication tool, you know, and when we see a commander up at the podium and, and the team around that commander, we know right away if they're collaborating. Trust me, we know right away. Did they just come there and meet for the first time? And I will say that really rarely ever happens. They have to collaborate. They have to prioritize. There's, there's things that you know really, really make an effective team because that's what it is. It's a team, and really that's you know counts that. And the commanders, as I tell them, they have to listen to other commanders as, a, as they're up in that podium, but also the, the questions that we're asking, uh, you know, to them. And, and, you know, I think that, that, that helps the, the whole process and obviously the agency. So the beauty, if I can, the, the beauty of a CompStat meeting, to my eyes, sitting at the other end, right, is that there is collaboration, housing, transit, mm -hmm. precinct, detectives, narcotics. They're all standing together and the questions are being asked and we're expecting answers. And you can't trick us. We know. What's the plan? What do you do? When was the last time those narcotic people were out in that precinct helping that commander? Yeah. We, yeah. Never, we never ask a question that we, we don't, don't know the answer. Is that what it's like in MTA? Um, no, it, it's not. But I, I wanted to get back to something about 2020 and bail reform and all these things because it's such a hot topic. Um, I'll take responsibility on myself. I was police commissioner at Yonkers at the time. I, I stood right with Commissioner Shea. We went up to Albany all the time, talked to legislators. And I think now, in hindsight, we went way too hard. And we were too accusatory. 
me personally, um, and we were too aggressive. And I think all it did was really turn people off. I think, I think the way forward is to rec recognize that this is a, and everyone always uses this term, pendulum, pendulum swings. If we're smart this time, if we're really paying attention to history, we need to make sure that pendulum, when it comes back, doesn't come back hard. Because if we can slow it down, the next time there's an iteration, it's only going to go back a little bit this way. So the key is to engage these legislators, talk to them over and over again. Commissioner Shea and I got the door shut in our face. That doesn't mean you stop. That doesn't mean you lay down. It doesn't mean you give up. Eventually, you work them hard. You wear them down. You keep on going. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I don't know if the politicians are as important as the community. I think we win the community. We win the elected officials. And, and the way to do that is to do what we're doing now, what we do better than ever. We've learned so many lessons in the last three or four years about how to engage the community. Explain to the community why you're doing what you're doing. Talk about stop, question, and fit, frisk. Talk about where it didn't work and how people got angry. Because listen, you can lower crime wall in, like crazy and have a very safe environment. If the community feels like we're not doing the right job, we didn't win, in my opinion. If we're gonna do this right, we have to find that balance between public safety and the community feeling secure in how we're policing. And I think we're really getting to that point going forward by engaging, explaining why we do what we do, and, and being willing to answer any and all questions at any time. Do you see that from the Police Foundation perspective? Absolutely, I, I think you have the community. That's what's very uh, frustrating about this. So they do have the community. Because those are the communities that are being victimized the most, as the commissioner mentioned. Frank, I have a, this might be an odd question about the Police Foundation, but it strikes me as odd that um, they need your money to, to buy a computer. <laughs> um, it strikes me as odd that people went out of pocket to buy land cable to fling wires out of Chief Anamone's office to get down to the new Comstat Center. Um, well, sometimes, as with the commuter, that expedited the process. Uh, but as you know, they have a huge budget there, but well over 90% of that goes to personnel and those resources. So we fund these strategic, yeah, so we fund these strategic, experimental, innovative programs that make that difference. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, it's just an observation, and I think it's something uh, that people in this room don't know. In 94, when I was a precinct commander and called down to my first comp stat in the press room, if you remember, uh, I had never been to headquarters to address the, the people I stood in front of that day. We were a very hierarchy agency. I reported to a deputy inspector who reported to an inspector who reported to a deputy chief who reported to the borough commander, who I very rarely saw. Going to headquarters, you were either in trouble or, or getting a promotion. No one else was down there. And we talk about you're talking to precinct commanders. That wasn't happening in 1993, 92, 91. We were people out there in the field doing our job. We were lucky to get to see our borough commander from time to time. Could you talk about how, how you guys attacked the structure of the department to flatten it, to be able to bring the chief of department, bring a precinct commander down, to have a conversation in front of a whole group of other commanders? We take that for granted now. Yeah. This was brand new and scary in 1993. And ComStat always was a wet armpit exercise. And it, it was never a lot of fun. But we got a lot done. Can you can you talk to to uh, to us about that just a little bit, Commissioner or Lou? Let me close with that, Joe, and thank you for that observation. Comstat, the focus has been on crime, the idea of crime analysis. But for me, as Commissioner from an outside entity, coming into this huge organization, I didn't know anybody. That uh, in terms of with over a thousand captains, inspectors, chiefs, how the hell would you expect to know anybody? But what CompStat provided was that opportunity twice a week to go down, and it's like the admiral in the, uh, up in his uh, top of the deck going down into the engine room. I could sit in that room and watch, basically, the leadership around the table interviewing the precinct captains and inspectors. And we developed eventually, as you're familiar, the profile sheet. One side of it was all the crime numbers, the intimacy, the other side, however, was basically a picture of the precinct commander, 
the executive officer, and then eventually all the way down the line, the squad commanders, and their area of responsibility and statistics relative to how they were doing. How was your sick time? How was your overtime? How were your auto accidents? So it gave me an opportunity when the list would come up each month for 40, 50, 60 promotions that I could basically look at the picture and say, I remember that captain. I remember that inspector. He did a hell of a job. I remember that inspector. Why the hell is he on this promotion list? He was a, he was a disaster. And we know sometimes how they got their name on that list. That, uh, so it was my way of basically beginning to exert some degree of control and intimacy over the department. And as Louis will tell you, and Joe, I think it reflected yourself, I relied very heavily on the recommendations for promotions because I really did not know people personally. But what I knew them from was that CompStat meeting and the profile sheet, and then the third confirmation would be the recommendation coming from a Lou Anamone, Joe Dunn, uh, a, a John Miller. No, so CompStat is very much about accountability, about the leadership team that you're developing, getting the right people on the bus, getting the wrong people off the bus, and getting them into the right seats. And it was also about the idea that uh, not everybody's going to be a, a crime fighter. That's just the reality of it. Some guys are extraordinary bureaucrats, extraordinary, and you can't function in an organization without the bureaucrats. But in a police department, you need the crime fighters too. The idea is the blending. The idea is getting all the hands on the flywheels that work together. And what you were talking about, Joe, is that there was no working together because nobody had the chance to basically get to know each other. No, so thanks for bringing that up. If we I, talked about crime, but it was a lot of it was about the idea of accountability. If I, Joe, Joe raised a, uh, an issue about flattening the organization. You know. Uh, our dear departed friend, John Timoney, was the mastermind behind that whole, so that kind of blended in with our CompStat work, but it made it a whole lot easier for us to have these conversations with people further down in the organization. Uh, remember when we did away we with the- We owe John a, a, a he, debt of gratitude. I remember the old Bonnie Miller show. Remember that inspector that would show up at the squad? And, uh, you know, every inspector had three precincts. They had nothing to do, so they'd go and pester at the precinct commanders. So uh, one of the first things we did is, you know, flattening the hierarchy. We got rid of that layer of bureaucracy and uh, took it away. And fortunately, I don't think they ever put it back. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And thank you to our moderators. Thank you, great job. And now to uh, close out uh, tonight's uh, event, it's my pleasure to introduce the Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives, Robert Barros. So I think we could spend probably three more hours here just listening to some of the some of the the insights and stories, and it's great. So I just want to thank everybody uh, that was a part of this tonight. We really do appreciate it. Um, this is a really incredible room to be in, um, not just because of our speakers and our panelists, but so many of you are either. Uh, our partners and colleagues in public safety, former members of the department, or current members. So I want to just first thank Police Commissioner Caban uh, for his remarks today and for his support, to our first Deputy Commissioner, Tanya Kinsella, uh, to our Chief of Department, Jeffrey Madry, and to uh, Chief LaPetri as well for being a, a panelist tonight, um, to our partners at City Hall, we see you, we appreciate everything that you do, thank you for being, being a part of tonight. And of course, we have to thank Commissioner Bratton, uh, Chief uh, Louis Anamone for coming back. Thank you so much. Thank you for being part tonight. Um, and to Brandon Maple and the Maple family as well, thank you. Um, really appreciate the efforts of uh, Hannah Myers and Peter Moscos for being our moderators tonight. Um, not an easy job to, to uh, herd such a large group, but we, we really appreciate it. 
Um, and I know he has more news to deliver, so I know he couldn't be here, but Bill Ritter as well for doing a fantastic job. Um, to the New York City Police Foundation, to Chair Philip Oswa, to President and CEO Susan Birnbaum, Executive Director Greg Roberts, uh, Isaac Rothbar, Taylor Kahn, and the entire team, thank you for your incredible support, assistance, and generosity. And then lastly, I just have to give a shout out to my team, uh, the Strategic Initiatives Bureau. Everybody on the team that led, planned, and executed tonight, thank you for everything that you do. I'm very fortunate to lead just a, a really incredible team. And then lastly, again, to just come back and say thank you to all of you. We really appreciate you being here and being a part of this very special occasion. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the evening.